Okay, without further ado, welcome to the first session in the UN Global Compact Network UK's Climate Forum, which is a, a series of, of uh, climate action sessions that we'll be hosting over the course of today and tomorrow. Today's session um, is brought to you in partnership with CDP, and we're absolutely delighted to have um, the CEO of CDP, Paul Simpson, joining us uh, for the call today. Um, we have a, a fantastic lineup of, of speakers. We'll also be joined by Sandal Giambo, the Global CEO and Executive Director of the UN Global Compact, by uh, Minister of State for Bayes, Kwasi Kwarteng. Um, as mentioned, Paul Simpson, we have Joachim Reiter, uh, the Director of External Affairs for Vodafone, a man responsible for their very ambitious climate targets, um, and uh, Marcia Balasiano, the Chair of the UN Global Compact Network UK from Relics Group. We're really, uh, okay, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we are in webinar mode, um, and so there's not a lot of um, uh, functionality for you. Um, we will have more interactive uh, sessions over the course of the next couple of days, and we'll, we'll have more on that for you as we uh, go through today's program. The inspiration for today was a publication produced two years ago uh, by uh, United Nations Global Compact, we mean business and the World Resources Institute, it's called the Ambition Loop. And it presents a theory of change that we feel um, you know, is absolutely urgent uh, in this moment. And it's very simple. Um, it's governments and business um, working, if not necessarily together, uh, intentionally driving change uh, on both their parts. For governments, a push coming from business demonstrating strong ambition. For business, a push coming from clear and consistent government policies. And for both, the ever rising um, ambition from the other side driving progress. Companies can help demonstrate commercial demand and the economic possibilities. Um, and so corporate climate actions and advocacy will lend political and economic support to government efforts to deliver on the policy goals that they've already established or, or hopefully will, will continue to do. And then on the same side, bold targets and strong policies from government provide clarity and confidence for business to invest and, and commit um, to a, a net zero world. A little more on on the ambition loop in the context of climate. What we need from government in, in their policy: a clear, ambitious targets and policy, predictable, a predictable regulatory environment, meaningful incentives um, to create the infrastructure that we're going to need, long-term market signals, support for research, development, and deployment, clear plans and timelines for full transition to a zero carbon economy. We're seeing some, but not, not all of this. On the business side, ambitious science-based targets. I think we can't really be clear enough that science-based targets are absolutely essential. They are the only truly rigorous uh, commitments that companies can make, and we really need uh, every company to step up. Public updates on progress. We need transparency. We need to know where we're at. We need investments and growth strategies that are aligned with a zero carbon future. Commercial demand for zero carbon energy, zero carbon transportation, and zero carbon land use. If the biggest companies are demanding these things, that puts real pressure um, on governments to help deliver them. And we need responsible policy engagement. I, individually at the company level, but also through trade associations. We need everybody behind this absolutely critical agenda if we're going to see it through. And there are, dare we say, green shoots. The Science-Based Targets Initiative um, has been tremendously successful. This is a collaboration between the UN Global Compact, CDP, the World Resources Institute, and WWF, also uh, working with We Mean Business. It brings rigorous methodology 
to the challenge of uh, corporate emissions reduction target setting. Over a thousand companies have signed up. Um, 480, more than 480 have actually set targets and over 300 have really gone all the way and set targets that align with the Paris Agreement um, challenge of keeping um, global temperature change below 1.5 degrees Celsius. This isn't just a bunch of SMEs. We're talking about companies with a market cap of more than 15.4 trillion USD. This is a very significant and important movement. If your company is not already on board, I urge you to take a look at this and get on board. This is possibly the strongest signal that companies can send of how serious they are about climate change is a commitment to a science-based target. Other ways of demonstrating commitment, joining in the race to a better world, joining the Race to Zero campaign. There's a, a link there for your information. Similarly, joining the Business Ambition for 1.5 um, campaign with Global Compact and CDP. Um, this is again, one of the best ways to demonstrate um, your commitment to build investor confidence, strengthen your company's reputation and drive change within and outside your company. On the government side, again, really strong um, cause for optimism. Uh, the Prime Minister published an article in the FT last week, a 10 point plan, um, which arguably is, a, is most uh, climate activist shopping list. It's got, um, it, it demonstrates tremendous ambition across a very wide range of, of really critical issue areas, building offshore wind capacity, uh, hydrogen economy, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, ending the sale of new petrol and diesel cars five years earlier than previously announced, promises of investment in public transport, a zero emission plane, um, action on home heating. Um, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic checklist. But of course, the devil is in the details and there is a tremendous amount of work um, and clarifying still to be done. Clearly, the, the government side of the ambition loop only works when that ambition is also matched with clarity and, and commitment. So now that this is on the table, um, this is where we need that ambition loop to kick in. We need business to step up and, and hold the government accountable to the promises that they've made. We're certainly looking forward to hearing from uh, Minister Korteng in a few minutes, um, further elaboration on this agenda. Um, and then later, we'll be hearing from Joachim Ryder from Vodafone on more on the business side of the, of the calculation. And of course, I think we're, we're seeing also um, some very good news coming from the US uh, this week. Uh, Joe Biden's stated plans for, for action on climate change from the US are, are really exciting. Um, doesn't stop just with their return to the Paris Agreement, but his appointment uh, yesterday of John Kerry to lead uh, their action um, shows again a, a genuine seriousness um, to this commitment and there's real cause for, for hope that the US will be returning to the to the climate community and showing the kind of leadership that we really need to achieve Paris. And, and it's already having an impact. Also announced yesterday, I, I saw General Motors um, withdrawing from litigation led by the Trump administration against California over the state's right to set more ambitious fuel economy and emissions regulations. I think this is just the start where increasing government ambition will lead to stronger and, and more ambition from business and vice versa. As business shows their willingness to step up, that can empower government to do more. It's a really exciting time um, and we're really uh, pleased to be able to contribute to that conversation today. Now I'm going to hand over to Sanda Ojiambo, who's going to say a few words of welcome to, to kick off our program. 
Greetings from New York. I'm Sando Giambo, the CEO and Executive Director of the United Nations Global Compact. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Climate Forum, organized by the Global Compact Network in the UK. This promises to be an important dialogue between business and government. To start things off, I would like to take a few moments to talk about our common interest in joining the fight against climate change. The private sector has a central role to play in that fight. This is true for businesses of all sizes, from multinational corporations to small and medium enterprises. It is certainly true for more than 11,000 companies and 3,000 non-business participants that have signed on to the Global Compact in the past 20 years. All these participants have made a commitment to adopt responsible policies under our 10 principles for human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption. By embracing these principles, they are also actively supporting the drive to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And while the world has taken great strides towards some of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, sadly, progress on others has stalled or even reversed. But one thing is certain, we simply cannot afford to hit pause on tackling the climate emergency and its irreversible impact on people and planet. At the same time, however, we confront a global pandemic that is devastating lives and livelihoods, disrupting supply chains, deepening inequalities, and undoing our work on sustainability. In response to this dual crisis, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is urging governments to work together for a green recovery from the impact of COVID-19, an accelerated transition to a clean energy future. Responsible companies are already working towards such a recovery. So far, more than 300 have joined one especially dynamic effort, the business ambition for 1.5 degrees. In the lead up to the COP26 climate conference next year, this campaign invites visionary leaders to commit their companies to science-based emission targets aligned with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees and reaching net zero emissions. Business ambition for 1.5 is led by the Science-Based Targets Initiative in close partnership with the UN Global Compact and the We Mean Business Coalition. The campaign is backed by a broad coalition of businesses, governments, NGOs, and the UN. But now we need the number of companies involved to swell from hundreds to thousands and fast. What we do not need is a false choice between a livable planet and a healthy global economy. On the contrary, taking climate action is the best way to build more resilient businesses, communities, and societies. Around the world, ambitious corporate leaders are sending strong market signals by scaling innovations up and carbon emissions down. They are aligning business strategies with a 1.5 degree pathway, not only because it is good for the environment, but because it is good for business. At this historic moment, I urge you to join Business Ambition for 1.5. We truly can recover better together. I'm confident that we will. The UN Global Compact is here to work with you side by side in the business of uniting business for a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanda. And now, without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to uh, the Right Honourable Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, Minister of State for Bays. Kwasi, you are very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here uh, this morning. Um, and it's a real pleasure and honour for me to be taking part in this event. Um, of course, my official position is as the Business and Clean Growth Minister here in the UK. But I am also a very keen uh, student of history, uh, and I'm particularly interested in uh, the history of trade, uh, in economic development, and really how the United Kingdom, uh, Great Britain's past, uh, can be reflected in today's developments. If you look at uh, British history, economic history, 
Um, you can see that a key moment uh, in that path uh, was, of course, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and that uh, event, that development, represented a coming together of commerce, uh, of the state, and also of technology, among other factors, uh, which transformed uh, Britain and, in the long run, transformed the world. We know uh, that those great benefits came indeed with great costs uh, for people and for our planet. I feel that today we are on the verge of another great challenge and a great opportunity, uh, which many people call the Green Industrial Revolution. And I think this Green Industrial Revolution will allow uh, both our environment and economy to flourish. As with the first industrial revolution, I think that the role of business and the private sector will be absolutely essential. I understand that today companies are facing an unprecedented challenge from the COVID-19 pandemic, but the threat of climate change means uh, that we must act now. In a year's time, the United Kingdom will co-host COP26 in Glasgow. We must work together to make sure that that is a success uh, for all our people. Uh, I think championing businesses who are taking the lead in climate change, uh, for combating climate change today is absolutely vital uh, to that effort uh, and also to the longer net zero objective. In this vein, I would like to thank our hosts at the UN Global Compact and CDP for the excellent science-based target initiative. Your work guides business to align itself with the Paris Agreement. I must also congratulate our third panel member, Mr. Reiter on Vodafone's new 2040 net zero goal announced only on Monday. This is an increase uh, a scaling up of ambition and something that we need right across our economy. I therefore call on you all today to follow Vodafone's lead and sign the Business Ambition Pledge for 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade. This tells our investors and consumers that you all understand the science of the Paris Agreement and that you all understand the great risk to your businesses from inaction. And I think it shows an understanding that business should be leading the transition and not caught out by it. By signing this pledge, you will join the race to zero, the largest ever alliance committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050, or as in Vodafone's case, even earlier. This alliance brings together all parts of society and now covers nearly 25% of global CO2 emissions and over 50% of GDP. We have seen that the evidence is clear and uh, the green choice is clearly the best business choice. As I mentioned earlier, governments and technology were uh, key participants in the uh, promotion development of the first indu industrial revolution. Governments must also play uh, their part as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and really seize the opportunities in the transition to net zero. Last week, uh, the Prime Minister demonstrated our commitment uh, to this challenge through a 10-point plan. By mobilising £12 billion of public and private financing, we will support 250,000 jobs with measures uh, including uh, ending the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030, and also by providing investment to lead the world in carbon capture usage and storage. We further believe that this initial investment will unleash uh, business 
uh, investment, the deployment of capital, even to a greater extent, uh, in the move uh, to net zero and in the energy transition. Through green technology and investment, we are seeing a really positive cycle of uh, feedback, of a virtuous cycle uh, for ambitious green businesses. And we are witnessing long-term cost reductions uh, coupled with uh, greater staff and consumer retention, which in itself drives uh, further innovation. This effect is rippling across the supply chain and the world of commerce at large. And in this way, it reflects very much the development of the first industrial revolution. We need to see uh, this ambition uh, reflected across the world by other governments and the entire global business community so that together we can uh, push forward and deliver uh, on the great goals and ideals of the Paris Agreement. On the 12th of December this year, the Prime Minister will host the Ambition Summit, a stage for global leaders to present new climate commitments. In order to galvanize uh, action, we will set out the UK's own plans ahead of this meeting. With less than 12 months to go until COP26, we need to work together as a global community to uphold the promises made at Paris five years ago. That is why it is absolutely vital, crucial, that your businesses step up by signing the Business Ambition Pledge for 1.5 degrees and by working with the Science-Based Target Initiative. Please don't be left behind. Despite COVID-19, 2020 has seen a record number of companies joining the initiative at an average of one per day. And by coming together, our call for governments to act will be even more uh, persuasive and even louder. We need to show the next generation that we've learned the lessons uh, from history and leave the world a better place and show that this transition, this energy transition, can both be prosperous and green. The time to act is now, and we have to act immediately as governments, as businesses, and also in our own personal capacity as individuals. Let's build back better from this pandemic. Let's stand up to the challenge of climate change. And together, I firmly believe that we can make a truly impactful change to the world in which we live. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to, to join us today and, and for sharing this uh, your, your insights with us. It's, it's very much appreciated. Uh, I hope you'll be able to stick around for a few more minutes and, and hear uh, Joachim. That would, be, um, that would be wonderful. And, and now, without any further uh, delay, I'm going to pass uh, the microphone over to Marcia Balasiano, who will lead the next session. Marcia, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you to the Minister, to you, Steve, to Sanda at the UN Global Compact. Uh, it's my great pleasure to host this session. It's going to be an informal conversation between Joachim, myself, and Paul. And I want to tell you something about their impressive background. So let me do a little bit of an introduction before I ask the first question. Um, Joachim is the Executive Affairs Director for Vodafone Group, and he's been a member of the Executive Committee of Vodafone since August 2017. Uh, he is responsible for public re relations and corporate affairs, including policy and regulation, communications, security, sustainability, and charitable activities. He's also currently an advisory board member of the World Trade Institute he sits on the board of the Swedish Space Corporation and is a member of the EU's Horizon Mission Board for Climate Neutral and Smart Cities. 
Prior to joining Vodafone, he was Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and the Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. Prior to that, he spent more than 15 years in the Foreign Service of Sweden, including as Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador to the WTO, and the Permanent Representative to the European Union. Um, and he has also served as an EU negotiator with DG Trade at the European Commission. So an extremely impressive background indeed. And over to Paul's uh, incredible leadership as CEO at CDP. CDP is a global nonprofit that drives companies, cities, and governments to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, also focuses on safeguarding water resources and protecting forests. Uh, Paul is a prominent thought leader on climate change with a focus on natural resource protection and the actions that governments, companies, and investors need to take to deliver the Paris Agreement and keep the world at no more than one and a half degrees. He sits on the board of We Mean Business, Science-Based Targets, the Investor Agenda and CDSB. He's also a council member of the International Integrated Reporting Council, the Global Stranded Assets Advisory Council for the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at Oxford. And he's also part of Friends of Climate Action. He has a background in finance um, and also worked at the Chesham Amalgamations and Investments Limited organization. So um, it has had a a strong role uh, in uh, the World Economic Forum as a member of the Global Agenda Council on Measuring Sustainability, and also has been part of the high-level panel um, on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and in particular, the Clean Development Mechanism Policy Dialogue. So that is a very impressive uh, set of CVs. And with that, I am going to ask you both my first question. So this has been an absolutely unprecedented year, as we know, and we had to postpone COP26 to November 2021. What are the implications of that? And how are you feeling about the potential for COP26? Maybe um, Joachim, first to you. All right, uh, uh, thank you very much. And I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, Maybe there is a, I mean, of course, it's very disappointing that we had to postpone it. On the other hand, to be frank, it feels a little bit like there is a blessing in disguise. And I would like to thank the minister for setting out what was uh, an extremely ambitious leadership that the UK will, uh, will show as a host of this important conference. So weirdly enough, we are now super stretched with battling COVID. But I think there are certain things that we can actually propel ourselves and from our learning of COVID. And, and one of the things I want to call out is the manner in which companies and government came together and pushed the art of the possible. The amount of things that we did as a company, for example, in this, com uh, in this context, together with governments across the world, would have been unimaginable uh, 12 months ago. If we bring that mindset into uh, the next conference with the right ambition, with the right setup, and with, of course, the UK also leading the G7 going into uh, uh, COP26, I'm very hopeful that this unfortunate delay can be turned into a source of strength and a source of higher heightened ambition. Great. Um, and how about you, Paul? What are you thinking about COP26 next year? Yeah. Hi, Marcia. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think Joachim summed it up actually quite well. You know, when at the end of last year, before COVID had really hit, we kind of said 2020 was going to be the year of super climate action. Uh, you know, as Joachim said, obviously COVID has, has hit and has uh, rightly taken our uh, attention of how we can manage this well. Um, so we have the delay of COP, but I think it is, as Joachim said, a blessing in disguise. Momentum has continued. There's a big concern. Would we see a real drop off in focus on addressing climate change and environmental challenges? Uh, and I think actually we haven't. And there, there is an argument to say this longer run up to COP26 now in the race to zero it is benefiting. Of course, governments under the Paris Agreement still need to come forward with upgraded nationally determined contributions this year. And it's been really heartening to see China, South Korea, Canada all come out with net zero goals recently. 
alongside thousands of companies we've heard on Science Based Targets. And Joachim, congratulations on your, your new 2040 goal. We're moving. We know we've got to get net zero by 2050. Can we do it earlier? And many companies like, like Vodasone saying, yes, we can. So that's fantastic. And, um, you know, at CDP, we were quite concerned this year, would we see less disclosure uh, on climate change? In fact, we've seen a 14% increase on disclosure from last year, some 9,600 companies disclosing through CDP on climate change this year. So I think the momentum is good. It's also important to note that the United States now has a president-elect who's made very clear they will rejoin the Paris Agreement. To have the world's largest economy step out of the Paris Agreement was disappointing. Um, to have them very clearly say they're back in, they're going to have John Kerry as a climate czar. Yeah, just one element of a whole thing that need to happen, but a very important signal. So um, there's still a lot to do. We're, we're not on track for a 1.5 or 2 degree world at the moment. Many positive signals. And I think we can be optimistic as we head towards COP26 with this extra time, but we have to keep challenging ourselves to go further and faster. So Joachim, uh, so impressive your ambition and indeed as Paul says, as the Minister noted, you are setting a benchmark for other companies. So why did you decide to do it now and how does it fit in with your broader environmental strategy? Well, as Paul referred to, and I, I think uh, it's important to keep in mind that um, we were quite concerned, actually. We had started a journey. We were laggard in 2017, just to, just to underline uh, that, uh, uh, to create a sense of what is actually possible. Uh, Vodafone, when we started looking at this, uh, we have had looked at environmental issues for a long time, but what we really started is to think more creatively and stretch ourselves around 2017, 2018. We then infor developed our purpose and became much more clear around what should be our contribution to society when we had a new uh, group CEO taking over, or which planet was one of the pillars that I was tasked to, to lead on. Uh, but we were worried that the COVID crisis would distract uh, attention away from environmental issues. And, and frankly, our first assessment, considering the socioeconomic devastation that this horrible virus has brought, it's only natural that we focus much more on inclusion issues. Um, uh, and, and, and trying to bridge a number of the divides that have been exposed in society. But to our surprise and actually to our great relief, uh, one of the things that we saw also in this crisis is that people started to question whether the systems that we had been operating for a long time, which the minister referred to as the, sort of the industrial age, whether we had a chance to rebuild them in a better way. And that's the whole rhetoric around Build Back Better. And that's something that resonates really well with the staff of Vodafone. I mean, the, even going into this, we have 15,000 people participating in something called Red Loves Green. So there's a huge momentum within the company for actually placing environmental issues at the top of our uh, priority list. So obviously, we just felt coming into this crisis, we had to double down on our ambitions with respect to our planetary commitments. And frankly, we do so on, on the basis of recognition of not only our role and our responsibility and the power, positive power of digital, that we are is our core business for achieving a, a green transition. But we also do it from the point of view of recognizing the concerns that legitimately exist around the ICT sector because it's data driven, it's energy intensive, and therefore our carbon uh, footprint as a whole of an industry uh, is uh, on an upward trend in quite drastically so in certain parts of the world. And we felt that we had a particular responsibility to show that it was possible to chart a new course, one in which we respect the boundaries of our planet and that goes beyond carbon by the way we also work on e-waste and stuff like that but but in the case of the carbon we felt that this was the time to put the stick in the ground to show that it is possible even for a very large and geographically dispersed company like ours to, ident to identify an end point and a very very ambitious end point so that really was what motivated us to double down in the process of establishing the science-based targets. And, and I think everyone has referred to the importance of having something which is credible and solid in terms of measuring uh, your ambitions and making sure that you actually go through the whole homework of running through what are your pain points, what are the areas in your business that you need to address. I need to underline because of the, the participation of probably a lot of business colleagues, uh, this makes utter good business sense. There is nothing in this that is charitable from our point of view. As we run through this and as we start with the basic question around uh, data drives a higher energy use, obviously it makes utter business sense to focus on energy efficiency. 
And therefore, I, we have approached this very much from always pushing ourselves to find new opportunities as a business, both from a cost perspective, but also from an expansion of our business perspective. So I would like to underline the work that Paul and, and colleagues have done in, in collaborating with us in that has been very enlightening for us and has driven us on a very short sprint from 2017, 18 until to where we are today. So it is entirely possible to do that. It is entirely possible to combine it with really good business logic. Inspiring. Thank you. Paul, do you have a question for me? Yeah, of course. So, you know, it's great to hear from, from Vodasone, but obviously Marcia, you know, you, you represent Relix. Um, and I know you've been really taking some um, ambitious commitments. Tell us about the, the commitments and actions you're taking at Relex. We are. So I'm, you're right, I'm here in two capacities. I'm here as chair of the UN Global Compact Network UK, but I'm also a practitioner like Joe Kim. So I am a group head of corporate responsibility for Relex. And I like to think of us as the world's knowledge company. For those that don't recognize that name, Relex, we are about science and helping improve health outcomes. We're also about um, data and protecting society through our analytics business, LexisNexis Risk Solutions. We're also about promoting the rule of law and access to justice through LexisNexis Legal and Professional. And we also have one of the world's largest events businesses in read exhibitions. So I can say, um, with uh, excitement that uh, we are in the process of setting our next round of environmental targets that will go from 2020 to 2025 and front and center will be a, um, a set of carbon uh, targets which are approved by the science-based target initiative. Um, so that is an important commitment that we need to make. Um, we have, we're, we're about incremental improvement year on year on year. And uh, this year we will get to 100% of our energy need from uh, renewable sources. So this is uh, a commitment that we made five years ago and we fully expect that we will make the commitments that we set um, on our carbon targets for the next five years. But let me tell you that it's also about the advocacy um, element and working within our sector. So we're in professional services. We also in, in some areas are in the media sector and we're part of something called the Responsible Media Forum, which just over a week ago launched the Climate Pact and Relix is one of the inaugural members of the Climate Pact. It's gonna require those um, that sign up to this to do two things. One, to set science-based targets, and on the other side, to use our content for good. And I wanted to give you an example of that, Paul and Joe Kim. Uh, we launched a few years ago, the free Relex SDG Resource Center. Across the businesses that I described, we've got content that maps to the SDGs, including on SDG 13, climate action. And to coincide with a five-year mark in September of the adoption of the SDGs. And by the way, such an important year for the UN at the 75th anniversary. And of course, it's also the 20th anniversary of the UN Global Compact. So we released a free report, which you can find on the Resource Center called The Power of Data to Advance the SDGs. And for every SDG, uh, you'll see also the dedicated graphic that we produced. And so it shows you what is the state of knowledge underpinning the SDGs? And on SDG 13, just like the rest of the SDGs, it's unsurprising that high income countries produce the lion's share of content. So um, the, the most prolific country was uh, uh, the US, followed by China, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Australia. But the striking thing, and this is going to using our knowledge to um, help to drive change, we found that um, low income locations were responsible for only 2% of the output on um, SDG 13, the research that, that needs to really drive action, particularly in locations around the world where they face the most challenges. So what that shows us is that we as a business and others need to step up to support those um, universities, researchers, governments, uh, libraries to be able to take the action that they need. So that's part of that second 
element of that commitment to use the knowledge that we have in terms of driving good content. Well, see, yeah, fantastic. And I think, you know, great to say, where companies have vast amounts of data and knowledge, as you say, and how to put that at the, the source and the, and the benefit of helping this uh, enormous transition. So wonderful to hear about that. And, you know, also with your new and updated science-based target, um, very, very exciting. Um, Joachim, a question for you. Um, obviously, you know, I know a bit about Vodafone, not as much as you, but I understand you know, a, a substantial part of your emissions come from the electricity used in the data and technology that, that powers the firm. Um, how are you tackling your, your scope to emissions? Because that's a, a pretty big source. And also, no, you're, you're a very large global business. How does your geographic footprint um, present challenges and opportunities for that? Hi. Uh, thanks for the question, Paul. Um, so, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, the vast lion's share of our um, our own emissions from our operations comes from the electricity we use to power our networks, which is uh, very, very significant. So 90% uh, of our carbon footprint comes from there. Uh, so um, for us, we started already when, in 2019 when we said we would have, uh, by 2025, uh, green gigabit networks, or green networks 100% running on renewable electricity. Actually, what we committed this summer was that by next July, all our European networks would already uh, be a green gigabit network, so already powered. So we moved that, um, that um, deadline forward significantly. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, for, it starts with energy efficiency and, and, and you have to think about our sector as one which data growth is massively increasing, which means that basically our energy costs would be also massively increasing unless you do something about it. So we've had over the last few years a 1000% increase in data consumption running through our networks, while at the same time we have reduced the energy um, per unit of data by 90%. So it makes utter sense to invest constantly in trying to drive energy efficiency in our networks and that's, that's obviously what we're doing. In the UK in particular, we have actually gone beyond flattening our energy consumption to start reducing it. And we saved some 10 million um, uh, pounds from, from those energy efficiency and measures. But beyond that, you know, for the things that we're still gonna have to consume, it's about changing then the mix to 100% renewable. And that can be quite challenging, as you rightly said. There are two challenges, basically. One is the bulk of our consumption is not really like Facebook with a big data center somewhere, and you're going to have a huge uh, a hydro plant or something uh, next to it. Um, ours is dispersed in the base stations that you have over an entire country. And the geographical disbursement of it makes it more challenging. Secondly, is that we are present in a lot of different jurisdictions with a mix of environmental legislation regulations that limits the availability of options for us. So what we have done is we've created a hierarchy of options, making sure that we a priority establish what is the minimum threshold of what is credible options so that we always go for the best uh, practice and the best available option in every market. Obviously in Europe, a lot will be around the power purchasing agreements uh, where that is available and where that is scalable. So that's something that we're devoting a lot of attention to uh, uh, currently. Uh, in some of our, um, you know, some of our African markets in particular, it's going to be challenging to do so because of domestic regulation. But we are working actually with local governments now to try to build up that optionality until 2025. So in Egypt, for example, we're working with the Egyptian government to revise the, the legislation around generation and distribution of energy through renewable. And, and making a commitment to build a very large solar plant that we can then plug into the energy distribution system of the country. Similarly, we're going to have to have those conversations. And that's why, you know, the, Marcia has made a really good point. It's not only about saying, what do you do, but actually on the basis of what is available, but constantly push to have an advocacy role, to engage with government, to engage with multi-stakeholder dialogues, so as to put pressure on governments to open up more options for us in some of our more challenging uh, uh, territories. So I'm quite confident um, that we will have one or more options in, in also in some more challenging uh, countries like, you know, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, South Africa, Tanzania, some of the places we're in don't have the uh, on-grid um, regulatory framework currently to give us all the options that we want, but we are working with those governments to make sure and with other investors to build that awareness of bringing renewable as a source of energy into the market. And therefore also showing that there's predictability by renewable investors 
by the power purchasing agreements that we are prepared to offer uh, to them. That gives them a, a de-risking their investment significantly in otherwise quite challenging markets. So I feel very confident about our uh, scope too. I mean, I, there are of course always elements that you have to work hard, but we are very, very clear that uh, we will achieve for scope one, scope two, our, our, our um, elimination of our carbon emissions by uh, 2030. And actually we will be absolutely sure that we will achieve our 2021 July for European networks, turning them entirely green and then globally by 2025. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, when we see, you know, we're talking a lot of this is about the momentum, um, you know, on disclosure, on science based targets. We have more than a thousand companies, including both of you. We also see many companies now committing, you know, to go as part of delivering on a science based target to go to 100% renewable energy. And I, I think the stories you tell about different countries is also something large global businesses can sometimes help take best practice or learning to different mm -hmm. countries. Yeah, you know, and of course, you know, adapt that to the, the local. Uh, environment. Um, at, at CDP we've been doing a lot of work with large corporations on their supply chain. You know, the, the scope three emissions, our supply chain program works now with 150 multinationals, some four trillion dollars of annual procurement spend and they're engaging their suppliers on climate change, water and, and deforestation risk in the supply chain. We saw some 8,000 suppliers disclosed this year and the purpose of this is really to provide the multinationals with the data and the information on how to make decisions, how to better manage risk, build resilience in the supply chain and, and seize opportunities by, by working with suppliers. Um, for both of you, and we'll maybe start with Marcia, how are you and your, and your businesses in, engaging your supply chains uh, on, on climate and sustainability and addressing this, the scope three emissions? Well, I think you just said it, Paul, about bringing up others alongside you. Uh, we, as a large company, we're uh, 30,000 people, 40 countries around the world where we operate uh, with a location, an office, um, means that we, we don't have all the answers. We're, we're working alongside the rest, but in our supply chain, there may be um, companies, businesses that could use our support. If we can be honest about the challenges and the journey that we're on and work with those suppliers, encouraging them to set their own science-based targets, also engaging on training opportunities to help them uh, rise up as well in terms of their ambition. Um, some of them will be very sophisticated indeed, but others will not be. So we need to be helping um, to make sure that we're all operating from the same green playing field. But let me just also say that in our industry, we have an issue of hidden emissions. So uh, many companies, uh, we still have uh, uh, data centers, but they have increasingly gone to the cloud. So you could say, well, that's fine because that reduces um, what I need to report. But actually, we need to be better as an industry um, that Relix is in to uh, get a sense of our share of the mission, the emissions that are happening in the cloud. So one of the ways that we're doing this, and to Joachim's point about multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, we are working with Bristol University and other uh, media companies on something called the Digital Impact of Media, DIMPACTS precisely to develop a methodology so that we can better calculate our share of what's happening from our cloud providers so that we get a better sense of uh, what's happening in terms of our scope three emissions. I would say that scope three emissions have been a little bit like a holy grail. We know they're out there, but how to actually calculate that well, that's been a real challenge. So I'm hoping that over this next five years, uh, we as companies are going to get better at understanding what's really happening in our supply chain so that we get a much more realistic picture and we can be more transparent about the data that's there. And Marcia, you made a lot of really good points. I'm not going to repeat them. Just to add perhaps from a Vodafone perspective, one of the things that we obviously sounds a bit harsh, but you, we, we, we are a very, very, very large company. We, we purchase around uh, yeah, equipment and and we get um, vendors to provide us uh, products and services of a value of 24 billion annually. We have 11,000 suppliers. So we have a lot of leverage. 
The question is, what do we do with that leverage, frankly? And, and that's the question that we pose ourselves and in, 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 a, in, a, in a partnership model that Marcia refers to, which is to engage with them, to ask them the right questions, to get them to respond, to put them on a journey. So we have done targeted um, uh, Q&As to or requests or questionnaires to suppliers. We got a response rate of 91%, 80% plus uh, have set targets for their own greenhouse gas emissions. So we're nurturing a dialogue with them around our expectations of what they should do if they want to be a supplier of Vodafone. And in September, we took a really large step in the sense that we said, you know, if purpose is this important to us, it should be part of our uh, uh, evaluation criteria for all suppliers under what we call the RFQ. So we have now, uh, purpose more broadly, including the pillars that Vodafone folks on, of which one is environment and climate. We have now allocated 20% uh, um, uh, uh, um, of our total evaluation of a, of a vendor uh, or a supplier is now based on their purpose, their contribution to our purpose and their own purpose. And, and, and that is, of course, a very significant proportion. 20%, just to give you a sense of the scale, is equivalent to the assess our assessment of their technology functionality. So we place as much emphasis on purpose as we do on their technology functionality of what they're offering us. Uh, and then the final point is, of course, none of this is going to be done by, by us alone. Yes, we have a lot of leverage, but we also realize that actually, if we come together through the GSMA with our industry partners, through I mean, our collaboration with you guys in CDP, as well as with the existing frameworks we have for tracking supply chains uh, under the uh, Joint Audit Corporation, you know, these are vehicles by which we can push faster a change in the supply chain and go beyond the first layer of the supply chain as well. So these are all measures that we have taken and that we're pursuing. But the big one was really to put a number in our evaluation criteria around purpose and climate. That's a, that's a big step. Maybe, Paul, I could ask you, I mean, uh, you know, you've been a little bit involved uh, also in case of Vodafone's evaluation of its suppliers. So, I mean, what, what are your plans going for? How can you support us as an industry in actually tackling the scope three, particularly with respect to vendors and suppliers? Because it, as Marcia said, it's a little bit like a black box that you have to open up and work through. So what's CDP's plan to continue to help companies achieve that? Yeah, th thanks, Jeremy, and, and wonderful to hear you talk about the, the way you think about that that leverage. And um, you know, I think you know, as we look at this, first of all, big companies they need some data and some information from their suppliers. And you know, as Marcia said, there's some some are quite sophisticated and large, and some suppliers are, are smaller and less able to do that. But um, you know, the first step is to get some some inf data and information to make an assessment. I, I think you know, from our perspective in the supply chain program. That's the kind of foundation, but then building off that is really, you know, the relationship, you know, the relationship between big companies and suppliers is very important. And, and how can that information create a dialogue with the supplier? But most large companies we work with, they're almost quite cautious. They, they don't want to be seen to be pressurizing suppliers too much, I think, you know, um, but integrating this into a procurement assessment as, as you have done and saying, look, this is one of our expectations. We are going to evaluate you on this basis. We want the information. Um, but to build the dialogue, I think there's some cases with suppliers where it's very easy for them to say, this is what we're doing. There's other cases where actually the suppliers really need some, some support and, you know, advice. Mm -hmm. And there's not that large companies have to be consultancies um, to, to, to what is expected and the journey. So, and we've found that, you know, very importantly, you know, the sustainability function in a company is, is obviously vitally important for this work, but to integrate that into procurement. So to work with the chief procurement officers, yeah, and exactly as you had, into um, the dashboards procurement um, people are, are using in their evaluation and into that criteria to set the expectation and to build, ideally to build a long-term better relationship with, with suppliers. But you know where where suppliers are not able to meet those expectations obviously you know they, they have to know that then they may not keep the business and that that dri drives a lot of change so we now see you know there is a strong data set um all the time to look you know for a large company what are the opportunities in the supply chain um to you know there's a lot of technologies a large company might already be using that its suppliers are not aware of not using we see some companies providing training for suppliers workshops uh, you know pepsico walmart and others doing been doing a lot in china to help chinese companies chinese suppliers 
you know, understand what's expected and how to do it. Um, we also see some companies now starting to provide even loans to suppliers for them to acquire the latest technologies and emissions reduction. So I, I think, you know, building off the data and the insights that come from the disclosure is really about that relationship and dialogue and, and setting those firm expectations. Sorry, Paul, could I just build on that? Because there's, there's one thing, you know, big versus small and the dynamic and the asymmetry of power, if you can, in a vendor relationship, that is always a bit delicate. But I just want to call out uh, also the reverse. Now, we, we, of course, one of our scope three is the products we sell to customers, the energy efficiency of the phones they use, uh, the life cycle of the phones they use. And we partner with a very, very small supplier called Fairphone that is now teaching us their thinking around circular terminal uh, uh, approaches. In other words, can phones be constructed differently in the future? Is there a way for us to develop an industry standard to almost like a CE mark around phones, which we're now working? It was actually because we worked with a supplier that we felt had more knowledge on certain elements than us, and we brought that in. So I agree, completely agree with you. So for me, it's leverage, but on the other hand, when you find those pearls, you bring them in and you enrich your own thinking by engaging with them and make them a strategic partner. No, it's a, it's a great point, Joachim. Know, it's often said that small companies sometimes find it easier to innovate, at least be very nimble than large companies. So it, it's great, it works both ways. I know we're not taking questions in the chat, but I just um, saw something come in about what do you do when you're small? And that really relates to something that we've been talking about, particularly if you have a large landlord that doesn't feel obliged to listen to you. Uh, I have one bit of advice, which is to look at the other tenants in that building, get together with them um, because they have to listen to all of you together. There was also a question about um, how being small and not getting the support from your landlord affects your CDP rating. But Paul, we'll let um, that colleague take that offline and reach out to you and team. But I wanted to ask about ESG because we have certainly seen uh, an increase in interest from our, from our investors. Uh, I was recently on a presentation by uh, BlackRock the world's largest investor. They have put a lot of store and encouragement of their investees, particularly around TCFD, which uh, the minister mentioned just before we began our conversation. How do you think you both, the landscape is, is changing? I mean, mate, I can start, you know, CDP, we work with investors since 2000 and um, it's really fundamentally changed, particularly in the last five years. And I think, you know, 2015 with the Paris Agreement Sustainable Development Goals did send a signal to capital markets. Uh, I think, you know, ESG, environmental social governance investing has become m mainstream. You, you talked about BlackRock, we, we do a lot of work with MBIM, the Norwegian Pension Fund, but, but almost all large investors now developing an ESG strategy and, um, and setting out the expectations that they want to see from companies. It's, it's really um, tightening up, actually, and, and we see that... Um, you know, investors want disclosure. We now have 525 investors with $106 trillion of assets requesting disclosure through CDP. But, but going beyond that thing, we actually want to see specific actions. Um, at CDP, we have a science-based target project with investors, some $20 trillion of investment capital, asking companies to specifically set science-based targets, including AXA and Leasing in General, uh, NICO Asset Management, so investors all around the world. So we're Ultimately, investors are forming a view of what, what managing sustainability risk it looks like and, and assessing companies, are they good enough? Legal and General in the UK just put out its own big climate change rating of, of a thousand companies um, using disguised data from CDP and others. So investors are becoming very sophisticated. And this is, you know, it's both a risk for companies if they don't demonstrate a good ESG strategy, but, but also really more an opportunity to have greater access to capital, higher share price, um, you know, lower cost of debt. We're seeing examples now of companies who can prove their sustainability credentials and managing the risk from that, uh, achieving lower cost of debt. So, so ultimately it's fundamental. And we see outside of Europe now, because it really was strong in Europe and the UK, investors are really pushing sustainability strategies in companies. And, and I think need to reward companies with that, um, that, that lower cost of capital in time. More sustainable companies should have a lower cost of capital. I think from my point of view, I, I echo everything that Paul just said, so it's not a lot to add, but uh, um, 
except perhaps to say that, again, we were worried that there would be a tapering off in the momentum uh, with the COVID crisis. If anything, we've seen that it's accelerating, which is, by the way, it's great. Uh, there needs to be a reward uh, for those that take very seriously uh, the environmental and social impact and governance um, uh, of their companies. I think that reward is not only one of sort of companies that are mitigating the risk, it's also the companies that are spotting the opportunities and, and to crowd in capital in, in the opportunity space. I mean, for, of course, Vodafone, we have here discussed a lot around our own carbon footprint, um, but we see it in a, in a comprehensive manner. I mean, that's why we came out last, uh, well, in July around our carbon enablement target, target, which is actually significant. If you talk about our own carbon footprint is relatively small compared to the opportunity of carbon enablement through digital, for, what we call digital for green, where we have pledged over between 2020 and 2030, we will save uh, 350 million tons of CO2 which, by the way, would be the annual uh, emissions of the United Kingdom in 2019. So it's very significant for a company like ours. But that requires us to really go deep in thinking about new pr propositions that help our clients, business clients, through IoT solutions and others to save uh, their carbon footprint. And, and if we can crowd out investment in those business opportunities, that's how you create that momentum for a bigger societal and, and structural change in the economy. So we see this as a very, very positive development. I just wish we could get to a point where, it, it, yes, it's becoming mainstream, but also developing a common language, a common framework for how we're being assessed so that actually it's less of dealing with multitudes and, and sometimes partly conflicting requests coming from different investors. I want to ask one quick question because we could go on talking for quite a long time, I think, but I'll need to hand over to Steve in a minute. So just a couple sentences. So first a, a comment and then a very quick response on, on a final question for you both. I think uh, we heard earlier this year, for example, uh, the World Economic Forum was mentioning about the rise of uh, stakeholder capitalism. And we've just had a question about the importance of investors in the mix. I think from my perspective, it's not an either or, it's, it's and, all stakeholders matter and there's still an essential role for investors as there are for other stakeholders, whether they be our suppliers or our employees um, and, and government. So on the government stakeholder part, my final question that I'm just curious about, so much focus on building back better, um, it ultimately requires companies and governments to work together, but what's the best way for business to engage with, um, with government on this very important agenda on um, having a net zero ambition, supporting the UK's ambition to get to net zero? Uh, Paul, if you, if you, maybe I can start. I mean, this is a very broad agenda, <laughs> a very broad question. I think we we have found a Vodafone, um, if you take our sector, for example, uh, uh, on the one hand, we're critical national infrastructure. We're seeing now, and it's become even more apparent on the COVID, how essential that service is to make sure that everyone is connected. Uh, and there are a number of digital gaps that we need to address. And we have realized, frankly, there's no way companies alone are going to address that. And, and that we realized even before COVID. So Nick Reed, our group CEO, came out in one of his first speech as a CEO talking about resetting the relationship between government and the industry and actually between all stakeholders. And, it's, and, and there is no conflict with that for, with the investor perspective because one of the main things concerned that investors are concerned about is poor returns on capital and, and rightly so. And that concern is a result of the manner in which the governments have defined the relationship with us as an industry, sometimes driven by our previous actions, which frankly were not particularly helpful from a societal point of view, and we needed to change. So we have taken the, um, we have taken the initiative to what we call the new social contract, where we're trying to reset our, what is the expectation, the legitimate expectation of us and our role in society at large and leverage that as a, as a start point point for a conversation with governments on also how they need to change the, the, the regulatory and policy environment so as to allow both our business to thrive, but also then to ensure that we close some of the digital gaps that are really uh, concerning for citizens. Uh, so this has been our way to try to forge a new relationship. We have created a sort of a pillars around it. We have clear targets set for ourselves that we are actively communicating to governments 
to start a conversation. Okay, if we are able to deliver this, in what way can you as a government also facilitate us, for example, closing the rural divides and the, the, the fact that many people living in the countryside don't have connectivity, which they should have, in all honesty. The fact that you have young people and elderly people that don't have the right digital skills to be active participants in society. How do we bridge that gap? So we're putting these things on the table as part of our ambition to take a lead in addressing some of the biggest challenges in society. But as a result of that, we also want governments to be serious about the manner in which they constrain us, which ultimately is in the interest of investors to be addressed. And, and I think, I mean, it's, it's a very important question at this point in time. It's, you know, we started at the start on, uh, you know, it's been a challenging year with COVID-19 and that governments are investing unprecedented amounts of money to, to shore up the economy and get us through that crisis, rightly so. Um, you know, and, and we need to use that government money that's being invested in the economy for the public good, ultimately, to, to build back better. That's a, a you know, common phrase. Joachim said it. Um, what do we mean by that? I think, you know, it's what we need to see. And we've got really in this much better place. Steve talked at the start about the ambition, Luke. Companies must set ambitious targets and have plans, sustainability plans, and, and show that they're implementing those, how they're implementing them, you know, real action is, is happening. And we see many great examples of that from, from both of you and, and many others. Um, but, but then there is this dialogue with governments, you know, no company can do it on its own, no government can do it on its own. There are some 300 companies have committed to business ambition for 1.5. That's more than, than how many countries have committed to 1.5. Hardly any countries yet have a 1.5 nationally determined contribution, many working towards it. And this kind of, the, the, the momentum around net zero targets for 2050 is, is fantastic from companies and governments. We need to see more of it, not everybody's there yet. But we also then need to see these very clear, and that's the science-based targets, a five-year target and a five-year plan of what we're doing to get there. Governments need to send policy signals. We heard at the start and we heard from the minister about the, the great work here happening in the UK to set those now clear policy signals of how we're gonna get here, the changes that need to happen in, in the economy. So this ambition loop, meaning the more companies, the more investors, the more policymakers that can move forward together is quite fantastic. It's you know, having worked on climate disclosure for nearly 20 years, it's great that the UK is now mandating disclosure in alignment with the TCFD, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. The UK government partly can do that because many companies are already disclosing and saying, here's the benefits we see, we can do it, it's good for business. And then the government comes in and says, right, we're going to level the playing field and send a stronger signal. So I think this ambition loop is key. And, and as we sit here now with a year to COP26 on climate change, how can we build that? How can, you know, I know, you know, within the telecommunications sector, for instance, there's a lot of working together going on within the sector. You know, so how can how can we all collaborate to create a real sustainable economy and, and then compete afterwards? Um, you know, and obviously competition is important, but we really need to see that. So I think we need a whole economy transition that's going to require everybody to act uh, and really ratchet up this ambition loop on the race to zero. Well, in terms of ambition, I can say that at Relix we are going to be releasing next year a free net zero report for the world in looking at the latest scientific research and the latest knowledge um, across a variety of, of different sectors, including looking at innovation uh, through patent information and, and more. So yes, um, I think uh, Paul, you, you put it so well, um, you're out there making sure that the you're encouraging us to disclose better, disclose more, and with your advocacy, um, encouraging us all to, to do our part. And um, Joachim, I think uh, you're definitely uh, a flag bearer for other companies in getting out there to set a net zero ambitious, uh, ambitious target and um, making that public. So thank you both. I really enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to speaking with you both again in the future, but I'm going to turn it over to Steve to tell us the rest of what we need to hear before we close. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marcia. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you, Paul. I also enjoyed that immensely. That was um, everything we had hoped for uh, from you all. A really informative and inspiring session uh, to witness um, 
really that story of, of going from laggard in 2017 to such a leadership position now that that really is inspiring and um, we really appreciate uh, Joachim sharing that with us. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this is the first event in our climate forum and we have um, five more sessions over the course of today and tomorrow and we will be addressing many of the issues that have come up over the course of today. Um, scope 3 emissions, um, just transition, um, investment and, and carbon offsetting. Um, later today, a session, a climate Q&A surgery. This is an opportunity for those of us that are working in the sustainability field um, that are generalists, here's an opportunity to speak with specialists. And we'll be talking about decarbonizing logistics. And we know this is one of the biggest barriers to companies setting science-based targets and, and going net zero. Um, and so this is a fantastic opportunity for you to pose questions in an interactive session um, to people that are um, world-leading experts in this area. Um, so we urge you to join us there. Um, at 3.30 this afternoon, um, we'll be looking at the global goals and a just transition, linking into goal 13, but how do we ensure that our climate actions fit into a larger, more holistic um, sustainability agenda? And we've got Rachel McEwen from SSE and Sue Ferns from Prospect um, sharing their fantastic insights into that. Tomorrow, we're looking at reducing scope three emissions at 10 a.m., specifically scope three emissions in the use of sold products one of the most challenging areas um, for any company. And we'll have Jonathan Dunn from Anglo-American sharing his insights on that. 1.30 tomorrow, a really exciting. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Richard Curtis um, and, and Tony Burden from Make My Money Matter, I'm joined by Emma Douglas from Legal and General. And they're gonna be talking about the Make My Money Matter uh, initiative, which is about um, using sustainable pensions as a pathway to a better world. Um, really important issue that's relevant to all of us as individuals, but also um, as uh, business leaders. And finally, uh, we're gonna wrap up the whole climate forum with a debate on carbon offsetting. Um, we have two teams um, all ready to go to do battle arguing the pros and cons of carbon offsetting. It's gonna be a fantastic session where we will really get stuck into this very challenging issue. Um, most companies contemplating net zero um, have got to be thinking about carbon offsets and removals and how will they um, incorporate them or will they incorporate them into their net zero strategy? Of course, we all recognize that real emissions reductions are absolutely vital, but also noting there are a lot of trees that need to be planted. There's a lot of other work that needs to be done. How are we gonna navigate that? This session is gonna be a fantastic opportunity to learn more about that whole um, massive issue area. To close, um, we spoke a lot about science-based targets today and, and net zero targets and um, a question came up in the chat that I, I just feel compelled to address uh, just how the two connect. You know, it's true a science-based target isn't necessarily uh, net zero, but nor is a net zero target necessarily science-based. And um, the two work together uh, really in, in great harmony. A net zero target to be achieved by a 1.5 degree science-based path, science pathway is really the objective that we all need. Um, that science-based 1.5 pathway is the absolutely essential first step. And, and I urge you all to visit the Science-Based Targets website, learn more about that, or contact CDP or UN Global Compact or any of the other partners in the Science-Based Targets initiative and get your company on board that important work. I uh, will just close to say you know, thank you to Sanda. Thank you to uh, Minister Boateng. Thank you to Marcia, Joachim, and Paul for your fantastic contributions today. I hope you've all found it worthwhile. I hope we will see you all again in a few hours for our next session. I wish you a great rest of the day. Thanks. <laughs>